Okay, it's the topography of the neck. Uh, we will try to slowly develop the, the knowledge here. Now, uh, to start with, you should know uh, what we are discussing here, you know, just because we say neck, you will not have a clear idea, you know, uh, the area we are referring to. Now, uh, the extension of the neck, uh, posteriorly, the extension is uh, much longer than uh, the anterior extension. As you can see here, this dotted uh, area is the um, area of the neck. So if you, uh, if you list the boundaries, uh, you can list inferior boundaries and superior boundaries of the neck. Uh, inferiorly, you start with the suprasternal uh, notch area, that is the superior border of the uh, manubrium, then the superior surface of the uh, clavicle here, uh, up to the acromion, this is the acromion. Then from acromion, uh, you draw a line to the uh, vertebra prominence for the spinous process of C7. Then uh, you continue the same thing on the other side so that you get a circle. That is the inferior uh, boundary of the neck. Then the superior boundary, you can start at the external occipital protuberance here. Then you go along the superior nuchal line up to the back of the ear. Then you go, go along the back of the ear uh, and uh, until you meet the, uh, the, the posterior border of the uh, ramus of the mandible ear. Then you go along the, uh, the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible and the inferior uh, border of the mandible uh, like this. And then you continue uh, uh, through the other side to the same point, external occipital protuberance uh, from the left side. So that's it, that is the anterior uh, boundary of the neck. So you can see that uh, compared to the, the extent of the neck anteriorly, the posteriorly, uh, the neck extends uh, fairly long distance up to the external occipital protuberance from the uh, vertebra prominence. So that is the first thing that you need to know uh, before you do anything else. Then uh, if you take a cross section of the neck as in this case, uh, you can see that the structures in the neck, there are many structures, important structures in the neck. Structures in the neck uh, are arranged in uh, several compartments. They are arranged in several compartments uh, because of the way the deep fascia of the neck uh, is arranged. Okay, it is the deep fascia that uh, separates neck structures into several compartments. So um, you can see uh, in the middle, anteriorly, there is what is called visceral compartment containing uh, the thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, trachea, esophagus, all that. That's why you call it visceral. Uh, is in that compartment. Then there's a larger compartment behind the visceral compartment, which is called vertebral compartment. Then there are two other very similar compartments on either side, this one and this one that is in front of the vertebral compartment on either side of the visceral compartment. They are called carotid sheaths or they are actually vascular compartments, okay? They are called carotid sheaths. Uh, the vessels are, vessels and the vagus uh, are there. We will go into the details of that little by little. Then the deep, uh, deep fascia of the neck now, like in any other place, uh, you have superficial fascia and deep fascia in the neck as well. Then the superficial fascia, as you know, uh, consists of uh, subcutaneous fat. Uh, the only difference is in the neck, uh, in the superficial fascia, you get uh, uh, a muscle called platysma muscle. Uh, so that's a, a panicular scaramosis type of muscle. Panicular scaramosis type of muscles are the muscles that are attached to the dermis. And when they contract, you can move the dermis. Now, all muscles in the face, which are called muscles of facial expression, they are panicular scarnosis type of muscles which are attached to the dermis of the skin. So when they contract, uh, the skin moves. Uh, so, you know, you can um, produce facial expressions. Now, uh, this uh, muscle that is found uh, in the neck that I referred to, um, platysma muscle, is, uh, is also actually a muscle derived from the facial muscles supplied by the facial nerve same nerve supplies, muscles of facial expression and the platysma muscle. So that one lies in the 
superficial uh, fascia of the neck. And when you contract that, you can actually move. You can move this. Uh, so you can see here when you do this, you can move this uh, skin of the neck when you contract the platysma muscle. Now here we are referring to a layer deep to that. Okay, because deep fascia is underneath the uh, the superficial fascia and the platysma muscle lying in the superficial fascia. So understand that first. Then deep fascia in the neck. Now cervical refers to neck. So rather than calling it uh, deep fascia of the neck, you can call it deep cervical fascia. Okay, deep cervical fascia. And uh, deep cervical fascia is arranged uh, in four parts. Arranged in four parts. First one is the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. Investing layer of deep cervical fascia, which encloses the whole neck and the muscles muscles um, in the neck, in the outer uh, circumference of the neck. We'll come back to it later. Then you get uh, this pretracheal fascia, which contributes to encircle the visceral compartment. Then you get this uh, pre-vertebral fascia, which encloses the uh, vertebral muscles, paravertebral muscles. Uh, and then you get the, uh, the carotid sheaths, which enclose the, uh, the vessels on either side that we discussed in the previous slide. So it is deep fascia that is responsible for this uh, separation into compartments, therefore. Then if you look at the, uh, the, the attachments of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia, so we are referring to this one, first one, attachments of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia, it is almost the same as the boundaries of the uh, neck, superior and inferior boundaries of the neck, because the investing layer of deep cervical fascia is attached to almost all of these uh, boundaries that we referred to in the first slide. So if you name them uh, here, it is the, if you start from one point, it is the superior border of the manubrium, uh, where it actually splits to enclose uh, some of these anterior jugular veins and all. Then uh, it is attached to the superior border of the clavicle up to the acromion here. Uh, then uh, then uh, you, you, you draw a line up to the um, vertebra prominence here. Okay, so it continues from there to there. And uh, the only difference there is uh, uh, compared to the boundaries of the neck, it is firmly attached to the superior nuchal, uh, uh, the ligamentum nuchae, sorry, ligamentum nuchae. You know, there is a ligament called ligamentum nuke. So if you have your uh, uh, the spines of vertebrae like this, ligamentum nuke is attached like that. Okay. Uh, so this uh, deep investing layer of deep cervical fascia is attached to uh, this ligamentum nuke. Uh, then uh, at the external occipital protuberance, uh, it's attached along the um, um, superior nuchal uh, line and then uh, up to the back of the ear and, and you know, uh, behind the ear, up to the mastoid, uh, tip of the mastoid process. Then uh, from there, it, it jumps to the, uh, the angle of the mandible and is attached to the lower border of the mandible and, uh, and goes to the other side, as I mentioned before. Then here, uh, the the gap between the mastoid process and the angle of the mandible, at that point, it splits, the investing layer splits into two layers, into a superficial layer and a deep layer. Now these two layers enclose the, uh, the parotid gland. Uh, the superficial layer actually forms the parotid fascia. Okay, it forms the parotid fascia and is attached to the, uh, the inferior border of the zygomatic arch. That's how it ends attaching to the inferior border of the zygomatic arch. Now the blue arrows that you can see in the background, that is the deep layer, uh, uh, that is uh, actually, uh, it is it actually forms a ligament uh, called stylo-mandibular ligament here uh, from the styloid process to the angle of the mandible. I didn't draw it there. Um, so that's how it ends at that point. Then there's another thing, anteriorly, um, it is attached to the hyoid bone. You get the hyoid bone here. It is attached to the body of the hyoid bone so that you know you get this nice uh, you know uh, angle uh, between the neck and the flow of the mouth there so that's, uh, that's the attachment of the investing layer of deep cervical 
a shear. Then uh, the neck is divided into uh, triangles, an anterior tri the two anterior triangles and two posterior triangles. If you concentrate on one side, um, uh, the, and, and this whole division uh, is based on the presence of a muscle called sternocleidomastoid in front and the, uh, the trapezius muscle behind. Uh, now, uh, if you take the midline here, if this is the midline, anterior median line, uh, if that is the anterior median line, then uh, I'll draw it from here, anterior median line. Uh, the triangle between the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and the uh, anterior median line and the uh, border of the mandible that is called anterior triangle that is called anterior triangle then the triangle between the, the anterior border of the uh, trapezius muscle posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid and the middle the superior border of the middle third of the follicle is called the posterior uh, triangle so you will have two such triangles on the other side as well. So each of these triangles um, are divided into uh, sub-triangles or subdivisions. And now there are more subdivisions in the anterior triangle, uh, but in the posterior triangle, uh, there are only two subdivisions. Now, this is how the anterior triangle is divided into subdivisions. That is because of the presence of the anterior and posterior bellies of digastric muscle. Uh, and the uh, superior belly of uh, ohm hyoid muscle attached to the hyoid bone here. That is the reason for the sub triangles. Now we'll take one by one and see. Now, because of the inferior border of the mandible and the anterior belly of digastric and the posterior belly of digastric, you form a triangle, sub triangle here, which is called digastric triangle or submandibular triangle. Okay, digastric triangle submandibular triangle. Then, mm, because of the uh, anterior belly of digastric uh, and the midline and uh, the hyoid bone, body of the hyoid bone here, you form a triangle called submental triangle. Submental uh, triangle, you will have two on either side there, okay, side by side. Then, uh, the posterior belly of digastric, anterior uh, border of uh, sternocleidomastoid and the superior belly of omohyoid forms an important triangle which is called the carotid triangle. There are many important structures are there in the carotid triangle. Then uh, similarly important triangle is a muscular triangle uh, formed by the anterior median line here, uh, the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid and the uh, superior belly of omohyoid muscle. Uh, hyoid bone also might contribute a little. Okay. Uh, so then that is muscular triangle. So these are the four important triangles in the, in the uh, sub triangles in the anterior triangle, digastric or oh, submandibular, submental, uh, carotid and muscular triangles. Then the posterior triangle is divided into an upper occipital triangle and a lower subclavian triangle um, because of the presence of the inferior belly of omohyoid muscle there. Okay, so that's simple. Then uh, if you look at the posterior triangle, uh, now there are several muscles that uh, contribute to form the uh, flow of the posterior triangle. Uh, in the, actually, the flow is formed by the fascia, pre-vertebral fascia. You know the fascia covering the muscles uh, around the, 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 verti uh, the vertebral column. Now this fascia, which is in a part is seen here, pre-vertebral fascia that has been removed to show the muscles that form the flow. Actually, it is the fascia that forms the flow. Uh, but you can take as, you know, uh, muscles uh, and fascia together and you can say that they form the flow because there's a clinical point. I'll get back to it later. So if you go by the muscles, uh, now these are the muscles from above downwards. You get the, uh, the semispinalis capitis muscle here. Very little only you can see there. Then you get splenius capitis muscle, second one. Splenius capitis muscle here. Okay. Then you get uh, levator scapulae muscle. Levator scapulae muscle is attached to the uh, superior border of the uh, scapula. Then you get um, uh, scalenus medius and scalenus anterior muscle. Okay. Uh, 
So these are the muscles that form the flow. And all these muscles are covered with this <coughs> pre-vertebral fascia to form the uh, flow. Then if you uh, look at the contents, if you look at the contents, shall I move this for a moment? If you can look at that, it doesn't matter. If you look at the contents uh, of the posterior triangle, now uh, the, the internal, uh, the external jugular vein, and now the, usually these uh, superficial veins are in the superficial fascia. So in the upper part of the neck, in that area, external jugular vein lies in the superficial fascia. Uh, and when it comes down, it pierces the, uh, the investing layer of deep cervical fascia which is actually the roof of the posterior triangle. After piercing that fascia, it then enters the posterior triangle. Okay. Then uh, uh, in the lower part of the posterior triangle, somewhere here, the, the external jugular vein enters the uh, subclavian vein that is coming from that side, subclavian vein, um, and ends there. That's how it happens. Uh, so therefore, the external jugular vein uh, becomes the content of the posterior triangle in its lower part somewhere here, okay? Uh, not in its upper part. Uh, anyway, it's outside the triangle in the upper part. Um, so remember that point. Then, uh, then the subclavian, uh, suprascapular, occipital, transverse cervical, all these arteries, uh, they are all branches of the uh, subclavian uh, artery itself. They are actually contents of the posterior triangle. Uh, then the accessory nerve, when I say accessory nerve, it is the spinal root of the accessory nerve. Spinal root of the accessory nerve uh, that is found in the posterior triangle, supplying both sternocleidomastoid in front and the trapezius behind. Accessory, spinal accessory. Then the branches of the cervical plexus. Uh, now the cervical plexus uh, uh, is another plexus in the neck if you have not uh, encountered it. You have learned about the brachial plexus, I suppose, if you have done the upper limb, you must have learned about the brachial plexus. Uh, cervical plexus light lies, you know, the, its, its origin is uh, above the brachial plexus. It's not as extensive as brachial plexus, but it has certain important nerves. Um, more, they are all uh, cutaneous nerves, actually. Now, the lesser occipital nerve, uh, great auricular nerve, transverse cervical uh, nerve, and the supraclavicular nerves. Now, the supraclavicular nerves are, are famous nerves because you know that they supply the tip of the shoulder and they are responsible for referred pain from the, um, from the diaphragm area, uh, from the phrenic nerve to the uh, tip of the shoulder. Uh, then this uh, great auricular one, which is this one, great auricular one, it, it actually supplies the skin uh, over the masseter muscle layer. Now, when you learn the cranial nerves, you will see that it is all cranial nerves that supply the uh, face in that area of thalamic maxillary and mandibular division of the uh, trigeminal nerve will supply, uh, give the sensory supply to the face, except this area uh, over the, uh, the, the, the parotid gland or the masseter muscle, um, which is supplied with C2, C2 uh, dermatome uh, through the great auricular nerve. Okay, so that's an important point to remember later on. Then uh, these other uh, vessels like lesser, uh, the other nerves like lesser occipital and uh, transverse cervical that you see here, these are all branches of cervical plexus. Okay, so this is a, a diagram to show you the cervical plexus anyway. Um, but the important point is this one. Important point is this one. Now, if I read it, though the branches of the cervical plexus and trunks of brachial plexus and subclavian artery and its branches lie deep to the prevertebral fascia. So these, all these things that, I, that we mentioned, most of these things that we mentioned, uh, the, 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 the trunks of brachial plexus, branches of cervical plexus and subclavian artery and its branches, they all lie deep to prevertebral uh, fascia. They all lie deep to prevertebral fascia. So from an anatomical point of view, actually they they lie behind the posterior triangle because the fascia is the one that actually forms the flow. But here we, we don't take it like that. From a clinical point of view, it is important to take them all as contents of the posterior triangle. That's why I said we would rather take the, the muscles as the flow. Okay. Um, so it, 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 you can say that, you know, you can use it in both ways. Okay. Uh, 
uh, anatomically it's the prevertebral fascia but clinically uh, you have to uh, disregard the prevertebral fascia uh, to list the content the reason is this reason is this if you read this you can understand the reason because during surgery from a surgical point of view uh, as long as the prevertebral fascia is intact as long as the surgeon knows that he did not damage the prevertebral fascia uh, then he knows that all these structures are safe because they lie behind the prevertebral fascia so it's uh, unfair for you know not to consider that these structures uh, are in the posterior triangle because it's so important to know that they are in the uh, posterior triangle area behind the prevertebral fascia so that the surgeon can easily uh, operate uh, in the area of the posterior triangle uh, without damaging these important structures that we mentioned here um, as long as they don't uh, disturb the prevertebral fascia so that is the basic point here okay so there is another point that i will just describe even though it's not directly related here now you see the superior root and inferior root here now that is you know they are uh, it is it is to describe the uh, a nerve loop called ansa cervicalis uh, now why it is important is that it is the ansa cervicalis later you know when we discuss we discuss several triangles there are muscles in the muscular triangle the sub triangle in the anterior triangle uh, now these muscles are actually supplied by branches of the ansa cervicalis uh, now this ansa cervicalis is formed by uh, actually this uh, initial spinal segments so it is formed by c1 c2 and c3 segments now what happens is uh, why this loop is formed c1 actually here c1 contribution to ansa cervicalis actually comes with the hypoglossal nerve this is a 12th cranial nerve this is the 12th cranial nerve uh, sorry this is the 12th cranial nerve um, so this c1 uh, branches of the c1 hitchhike you call it hitchhike goes along with the hypoglossal nerve uh, to some distant and then it leaves it gives branches to another muscle then it leaves here uh, and forms the superior root of ansa cervicalis it forms the superior root of ansa cervicalis then uh, branches from c2 and c3 they form the inferior root of ansa cervicalis so ultimately they form a loop okay so this loop uh, encircles some of the important structures here in the neck we'll come back to it later so this ansa cervicalis the moment you hear the uh, the name remember that uh, it supplies uh, the, the muscles in the neck muscular muscles in the muscular triangle uh, in relation to the thyroid gland and all we will come back to it later then uh, you already know that the prevertebral fascia lies in front of prevertebral muscles. Then the other important point is uh, you will be able to appreciate this fact. If you have done the upper limb already, you have, you have encountered axillary sheath encircling uh, the branches of the brachial plexus and the axillary artery. Uh, and this axillary sheath is actually uh, considered as an extension of the prevertebral fascia because you get all these uh, now if this is prevertebral fascia you get all these uh, branches of brachial plexus and uh, uh, subclavian artery uh, all that behind the prevertebral fascia so when these things go into the upper limb it uh, tends to drag prevertebral fascia with that forming the axillary uh, sheath here so that is the idea okay so there are different ways in which people describe anatomy okay so this is uh, how it is formed so this is prevertebral fascia and this is axillary sheath containing axillary artery and uh, branches of uh, brachial uh, plexus. Uh, usually, you know, there are two ways in which it is described. Subclavian vein is said to be uh, outside the sheath because it has to expand when it fills with blood. Uh, some people say that it is within the axillary sheath, but the sheath is weak on that side uh, to allow uh, the expansion of vein. But then, you know, other people say that it is outside the axillary sheath. Uh, I think you know it's better to take it as outside the axillary sheath, axillary vein. I'm referring to. Okay, so this is the relationship between the axillary sheath and the prevertebral fascia. Then 
another important point uh, now the prevertebral fascia extend from the base of the skull its upper attachment is to the base of the skull remember that point and its lower attachment is to the anterior longitudinal ligament at the level of the lower border of the t4 body okay at the level of the lower border of the t4 body it is attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament that is the extent of the um, pre-vertebral fascia now uh, if i ask you uh, what this attachment is it is not pre-vertebral fascia of course this is the attachment of the pharynx this is the attachment of the pharynx to the base of the skull okay it's a rough rough uh, drawing but it's, it's somewhere like that okay now if you uh, draw the attachment of the pre-vertebral fascia here uh, this is the attachment of the pre-vertebral fascia the brown line that is the attachment of the pre-vertebral fascia that is behind the attachment of the pharynx to the base of the skull then this is actually the attachment of the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament which which is a structure attached to the bodies and the intervertebral discs of the spine anteriorly okay so this uh, anterior longitudinal ligament is firmly attached to the periosteum of the bone here and the perichondrium of the, um, the fibro and hyaline cartilages in the art, art, uh, uh, intervertebral disc now this one goes up and gets attached to the base of the skull okay so then uh, now this uh, pre vertebral fascia is in front of it comes all the way down to the uh, the level of the lower border of the t4 and gets uh, it blends with the or gets attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament and that's the end of the pre vertebral fascia okay so we'll we'll come back to it later again anyway then uh, on either side on either side here you get the carotid sheaths on either side you get the carotid sheaths uh, uh, encircling the carotid canal and the uh, jugular foramen um, within that sheath because you you get the internal uh, the, you get the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein directly entering the carotid sheaths we'll come back to it again okay a lot of things to develop here then the other point is you can see this red line here so that actually represents the posterior atlanto occipital membrane i don't know whether you have heard about this membrane posterior atlanto occipital membrane um, that is between the posterior arch of the atlas and the uh, the posterior border of the uh, the foramen magnum now even though i say that uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament is attached to the uh, the base of the skull here in front of the foramen magnum actually uh, at that point uh, by by the time it reaches the base of the skull it is not called anterior longitudinal ligament um, you call it actually the uh, the anterior atlanto occipital membrane because you have the posterior one here this is the anterior one um, because uh, what happens is if you have the uh, atlas here anterior and posterior arches you have the the, the, the foramen uh, magnum there you get this posterior atlanto occipital membrane and the anterior atlanto occipital membrane covering up it anterior and posteriorly uh, and then this continues down as the anterior longitudinal ligament this one okay so i mean if you really want you can say that the anterior longitudinal ligament also continues up to the base of the uh, skull and and blends with the uh, anterior axial atlant occipital membrane or whatever you know different anatomists describe it, these things in different ways um, so remember if you if you haven't heard about this uh, atlant occipital membranes just you know read it as homework you read uh, about atlant occipital uh, membranes now uh, now remember this uh, diagram you know why i drew this diagram is uh, students find it difficult to orient these things you know in when you come for viva exams and all you might not have viva uh, in your faculty but still be able to handle these things especially when you go for postgraduate exams later on if you want to do surgery um, then you know you might have to uh, know these things uh, very well so have a rough idea how these structures are attached to the base of the skull simple then if you look at this diagram you can see that now this is uh, esophagus uh, or you know in the upper part of the neck it should be the pharynx okay continuation of the esophagus up now this is prevertebral fascia prevertebral fascia now uh, 
therefore now this <coughs> space between the space between the uh, the, the vascular compartment uh, or you know you can say the pharynx space between the pharynx and the prevertebral fascia is called retropharyngeal space retropharyngeal space retropharyngeal means space behind the pharynx okay uh, so remember that the posterior boundary posterior limit of the retropharyngeal space is therefore the prevertebral fascia okay that is this fascia prevertebral fascia okay so this is uh, from last i think this uh, nice diagram now you see it's attached to the base of the skull prevertebral fascia you can call it uh, at the upper end the anterior atlantic occipital membrane as uh, i said but uh, then you know it comes down comes down all the way and is attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament here at the lower border of t4 okay that's the point i wanted to raise then the other point that you have to recall is you have done the thorax now uh, you have done the mediastinum now this line you can see this horizontal plane that is the plane that passes through the uh, sternal angle angle of lewis uh, and the lower border of t4 or you can say t4 t5 junction or you can say um, intervertebral disc uh, fourth intervertebral disc but either you know whatever the way you want to call it that plane is an important plane because that plane uh, that plane is the plane between the superior mediastinum above and the inferior mediastinum below okay uh, and the inferior mediastinum is further divided into uh, an anterior mediastinum uh, middle one anterior one middle one and a posterior one because of the presence of the heart and the pericardium here okay so that forms the middle one in front of it you get the anterior and behind it you get the posterior mediastinum now the point here is this is a clinically important point uh, whatever that uh, is collected inside the uh, collected behind the, uh, the prevertebral fascia if it tracks down say a pus or something if it tracks down or infection uh, it will be limited at this attachment at the lower border of t4 so in other words it will not enter the inferior mediastinum okay so it will be limited to the superior mediastinum area and it will be behind the superior mediastinum uh, so usually you know if an infection arises in the vertebral bodies or intervertebral discs uh, they will be limited in front by the attachment of the prevertebral fascia and uh, even if it goes in front uh, it will not come down below this point it gets uh, attached there okay so that's the point i'll show you in a different slide infections of the neck how it spreads down uh, okay then uh, these other points uh, the phrenic nerve uh, lies behind prevertebral fascia sympathetic trunk lies in front of it uh, okay, that part I'll show you in a separate diagram. Okay, this is what I mean here. Uh, last few sentences there. If this is posterior side, if this is posterior side and this is anterior side, uh, that's how you uh, take the relationships. Uh, so this should be lateral and this should be medial, therefore. So then, uh, what I have drawn here is the scalenous anterior muscle. Okay, scalenous anterior muscle. Now, phrenic nerve lies on scalenous anterior muscle. Now, if you happen to dissect the neck, this is something that you should identify uh, and remember all the time. Uh, if you get your scalenous anterior muscle is like this, coming from the neck to the, uh, the, the scalene tubercle on the first rib. Okay. Your scalenous anterior muscle is coming like this. Your phrenic nerve is crossing the muscle like that. Okay. It's so very nicely shown in almost all the uh, specimens. Okay. So if you see a very slender, it's not a very large nerve, slender nerve crossing the scalenous anterior muscle like this, that is phrenic nerve. So it lies in front of the scalenous anterior muscle. When you get specimens, some day, some future day, you know, if COVID settles, then you will be able to see these things. So remember this relationship, phrenic nerve lies immediately behind it. So if I draw the prevertebral fascia, that lies in front of the phrenic nerve. Okay, that lies in front of the phrenic nerve. So, in other words, phrenic nerve is sandwiched between the prevertebral fascia and the scalenous uh, anterior muscle. Then, the sympathetic chain also lies in that same area. It is slightly medial to the phrenic nerve and in front of the prevertebral fascia. Okay, these things are sometimes difficult to uh, 
uh, demarcate in your dissections because the moment you damage pre vertebral fascia in your dissections, if you are not very careful, you will not appreciate this fact that one is in front and one is behind. Okay. Um, so if the pre vertebral fascia is intact, okay, you can still damage the sympathetic chain. I said the surgical point of view, uh, as long as you don't damage the pre vertebral fascia, these structures are safe. I said, okay, structures lying behind the pre vertebral fascia. So that will not be applicable to sympathetic chain, therefore. Okay. Then if you draw the carotid sheets that we were referring to, we'll come back to it. Carotid sheets containing the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery in the upper part and the common carotid artery in, its, uh, in the lower part of the neck, uh, that is carotid sheath, it lies in front of the sympathetic chain. In other words, sympathetic chain is sandwiched between the pre-vertebral fascia and the carotid sheath. When you lift the carotid sheath that way during your dissections, you can see the sympathetic chain lying behind it. Then, that's not all. Inside the carotid sheath, inside the carotid sheath, posterior and in between the two vessels, lies the vagus nerve, which is an important nerve, one of the most important cranial nerves, vagus nerve. So see the relationships now, phrenic nerve here, lying in front of the scalenous anterior muscle, behind the pre-vertebral fascia, sympathetic chain uh, lying between the carotid sheath and the pre-vertebral fascia, and the vagus nerve lying inside the carotid sheath, that is in front of the sympathetic chains. Uh, so, Actually, you know, to see the vagus nerve, the best way is to split the um, carotid sheath here and separate the, the two vessels. Okay, then you see the vagus nerve behind it. If you don't damage the carotid sheath here, you will uh, have the sympathetic chain behind that layer. Okay, I think you understand it. Then the pretracheal fascia. Pretracheal fascia is. Uh, is attached now that is the upper limit of pretracheal pre fascia it's attached to the body of the hyoid bone there it's attached to the body of the hyoid bone there then it is attached to the, uh, the thyroid cartilages here anterior uh, part of thyroid cartilages then along the oblique line of the thyroid cartilages okay then laterally here it blends with the carotid sheets it blends with the carotid sheets and close up here okay and it goes all the way down into the superior mediastinum and blends with the adventitia of the uh, arch of the aorta and the fibrous pericardium okay so it blends with all these uh, structures and uh, close basically close the, uh, the the spaces lying in front with the spaces lying behind okay so this is a diagram of the carotid sheath diagram of the carotid sheath to show you the structures inside. So this it says common carotid artery. So this must be therefore below the uh, level of the uh, C4, below C4 level because uh, it's at C4 level or the superior border of the thyroid cartilage level that the common carotid artery divides into external carotid and internal carotid. So it's C4 level. You get the common carotid artery like that and getting divided into internal carotid and external carotid. So it's either C4 or superior border of the superior border of the thyroid cartilage. Okay, that is the point. So this section has been taken at a lower level so that you get the common carotid. If you take a higher neck uh, cross section, um, instead of um, common carotid, you get the internal carotid, uh, internal carotid in the carotid sheath, not the external carotid. Okay. Uh, so when you draw the carotid sheath, it's either common carotid inside or internal carotid. Then you have the internal jugular vein. Then you have this vagus nerve in that position that I mentioned. Okay. Other than that, you get uh, some of the deep cervical lymph nodes inside the carotid sheath. Okay. There are superficial cervical and deep cervical lymph nodes. You can see another structure that I didn't mention before. This is this is the ansa cervicalis uh, passing around this structures forming the loop okay then this uh, uh, one clinical correlation here uh, now now the pre vertebral fascia as you know is attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament here at the t4 level and pre tracheal fascia so that is pre tracheal fascia this one as you can see it blends with the 
advantage of the great vessel seal. Okay. Now, if there is a neck infection behind prevertebral fascia, as I said before, behind prevertebral fascia, like this dotted line, uh, it, it tracks down behind the prevertebral fascia into the thoracic cavity only up to the superior mediastinum. Okay, so it will be limited to the posterior part of the superior mediastinum. It will not enter the inferior mediastinum usually. Okay, and on the other hand, neck infections in front of the pretracheal fascia, pretracheal fascia, which is this one, pretracheal fascia, tracks down into the anterior mediastinum. Okay, because the middle mediastinum would be in that area. Okay, it, it tracks down into the anterior mediastinum. And neck infections between these two layers, neck infections between prevertebral fascia, which is this one, and the pretracheal fascia, which is this one, will go behind the middle mediastinum. Okay, go behind the middle mediastinum, um, anterior and middle mediastinum, um, and goes into the posterior mediastinum. Okay, it goes into the posterior mediastinum. I don't know whether I have that diagram here. It's too far away. Okay, so neck infections coming like this will go into the posterior mediastinum in front of the pretracheal. This is pretracheal fascia. Will go into the anterior mediastinum. And behind the prevertebral fascia will limit at the superior mediastinum level. So that's what I wanted to mention. Then, if we discuss the two anterior triangles. Hmm. Now, if, uh, if this is your neck and we are discussing about the, the if, your, if your mandible is like this, uh, like this, uh, if, if this is the midline and your hyoid bone is like this, okay, you can actually describe the muscles of the anterior triangle in two groups. Now, the muscles lying above the hyoid bone this is hyoid, okay. Hyoid bone. Muscles like uh, okay. muscles lying above the hyoid bone are called suprahyoid muscles. Muscles lying that is in that area, okay. The flow of the mouth and all. And muscles lying below the hyoid bone are called infrahyoid muscles. Now here we are discussing the suprahyoid muscles. Okay, suprahyoid muscles, mostly the muscles in the flow of the mouth. Uh, now, there are digastric muscles, anterior belly, the uh, posterior belly and anterior belly of digastric muscles uh, and stylohyoid muscle from the styloid process to the hyoid bone here, stylohyoid muscle. Then you have the mylohyoid muscle. It, it forms a sheet like thing. Okay, so mylohyoid is like a sheet forming the flow of the mouth. And the geniohyoid. Geniohyoid means from the now in the mandible. If you look at the mandible, uh, if uh, I don't know whether I should draw it. Uh, so if this is the mandible inner aspect, you must have seen the two genial tubercles there, upper and lower genial tubercles. So then you have the hyoid bone here. There's a muscle attached between the hyoid bone and this genial tubercles, which is called the genio. That's why you call the geniohyoid muscle. That also forms the flow of the. Uh, mouth. Uh, so all these muscles will constitute the suprahyoid uh, muscles. If you look at the nerve supply, you can see here the digastric muscle is uh, a peculiar one. It has an anterior and posterior belly. Anterior belly is supplied by nerve to mylohyoid. That's a branch from the, uh, sub, the, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The anterior belly is supplied by the facial nerve. Okay, and they have a Two different origins also. Okay, they, they, their embryological origin is different. That's why the nerve supply is different. Then the stylohyoid is also by the facial nerve. Mylohyoid again is the same nerve as this one uh, from the mandibular division. Uh, mylohyoid nerve and the geniohyoid uh, is supplied by this C1 root uh, hitchhiking with the hypoglossal nerve. Um, part of it will contribute to form the ansa cervical. Is coming like this. This is hypoglossal nerve. C1 is coming like this, and part supplies the part of it supplies the uh, genio 
hyoid muscle and part goes to uh, shoulder uh, uh, form the ansa cervicalis, the superior root. Other part will supply the genio hyoid here. Okay. Okay, this is how you see these muscles. So this is the anterior belly of digastric. Okay. And this is the posterior belly of digastric. And this is the mylohyoid muscle. You don't see the geniohyoid. For you to see the geniohyoid, which is here, you have to cut and open the mylohyoid muscle. It's covered with the mylohyoid muscle. Then your stylohyoid is coming from there. It's not also, it's also not drawn here. Okay. Then these other muscles are called infrahyoid muscles. Infrahyoid muscles, sternohyoid, sternothyroid, thyrohyoid, and homohyoid. So these are these are actually these muscles. Okay. These are actually these muscles. Now it's easy to remember. Now, if this is your, <coughs> I will draw the same thing here. If this is your hyoid bone, okay, and if this is your uh, 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 thyroid cartilage, okay. This is your thyroid cartilage. And if this is your sternum here, okay. Uh, in the deep layer, you have a muscle between these two. That is called thyrohyoid, between the thyroid and hyoid. Then you have another muscle called sternothyroid. It is between the sternum and the thyroid cartilage. Sternothyroid, thyrohyoid. Then you have sternohyoid muscles here. Sternohyoid. From sternum to hyoid directly, that is superficial to other two muscles because it goes a long way here. Then you get this omohyoid going here, superior belly here and inferior belly getting attached to the, uh, the scapula, superior border of the scapula. Okay. Uh, so that's how you remember these muscles. It's easy to remember, not difficult. And this... Uh, these are the muscles that are supplied by the uh, ansa cervicalis. If I, if I go back here, infrahyoid muscles, um, you can see these are supplied by ansa cervicalis C1 to C3, ansa cervicalis. Okay. Uh, okay, now this diagram is a uh, little bit complicated diagram. It's a little bit complicated diagram. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, whether I should uh, just uh, just describe it uh, this way because if you have not seen specimens, next specimens so far, you will not be able to grasp uh, many things. Uh, you have to have a background knowledge to understand it. But I will refer to it. Uh, maybe you know, I will go to the next slide and come back uh, based on the importance of it. Okay. Uh, not really. No, I, I will try to describe this anyway. Now, uh, now these are the things that you see here. You you have the vagus nerve here. Okay, before the vagus nerve, you take the, now this is the common carotid. This is the common carotid artery. Now it divides into uh, an internal carotid and an external carotid. Now you can see the common carotid and the internal carotid. Common carotid, common carotid and the internal carotid both do not have branches in the neck. Okay, that's an important point. But the external carotid, in contrast, has got many branches in the neck. Okay, external carotid has got many branches in the neck. Internal and common carotid has got no branches. And this level is roughly, this level is roughly the, 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 the C4 level. So you can see it's, it, it matches with the superior border of the um, thyroid cartilage. That's where the common carotid bifurcates into internal and <coughs> external carotid arteries. So that point is uh, something that you need to remember. So if you cut the carotid sheath above C4 level, you will see the internal carotid, uh, uh, not the common carotid. And if you cut below that level, you see the common carotid. Okay. Um, and, uh, and the other point that you can see here is, sorry, the other point that I wanted to show you. Okay, now this one. Now here, okay, this one was very here. Okay, now this one, hypoglossal nerve. Okay, this is what I wanted to catch here. Hypoglossal nerve. Now see the arrangement of the hypoglossal nerve. It comes like this, can you see? And goes around the external carotid 
artery external carotid artery uh, before it enters the um, mouth it has to enter the oral cavity it has to supply the muscles of the tongue here okay muscles of the uh, tongue almost all the muscles of the tongue are supplied by the hypogastral nerve 12th cranial nerve and uh, and at that point where it crosses these vessels here it gives the superior um, superior uh, root of the ansa cervicalis uh, with c1 you know it's c1 uh, component then the other thing is you see the internal jugular vein here internal jugular vein here coming out from the jugular foramen um, so all of this you know external carotid and internal jugular vein they lie within the uh, the carotid sheath if you draw the carotid sheath like this in this upper end you will have the internal jugular vein internal carotid artery you have the vagus nerve not only that you will get the, uh, the hypoglossal nerve also entering this and even if i if i remember it correctly even the uh, the, the, the spinal root of the accessory nerve uh, that all that enters the carotid sheath uh, in the upper end then you know in the lower part you will not have it because other other nerves leave it okay even the hypoglossal nerve might go through i'm not very sure oh no no hypoglossal nerve comes out through the uh, hypoglossal canal it's different okay then the carotid triangle the other sub triangle that we were uh, discussing about uh, carotid triangle the, the an important uh, landmark bony point to get at the carotid triangle is the uh, the tip of the greater horn of the hyoid okay tip of the greater horn of the hyoid so if you touch the tip of the it's not easy to, it's not difficult to touch you can touch the hyoid bone but remember to touch only one side usually if you touch both sides at the same time you can get fainted sometimes okay because you touch the, uh, the marrow receptors there okay so if you touch the greater horn of the hyoid here uh, so then you are properly at the carotid triangle uh, and actually you know if you if you press here actually you can feel uh, the, the carotid uh, pulse pulse of the uh, the carotid artery there you can uh, press against the uh, the laryngeal cartilages uh, so that is one point that uh, is important to remember. Then you can also see that in this uh, carotid triangle, the hypoglossal nerve again going around the external carotid artery very nicely here and entering the, uh, the flow of the mouth passing between the hyoglossus and the mylohyoid muscles. Hyoglossus is actually a muscle belonging to the tongue, hyoglossus. Okay. Uh, and mylohyoid is the muscle of the flow of the mouth. So here it, it nicely goes behind these two, deep to the posterior belly of digastric as well. Okay. Um, and you can see another thing here. Uh, now this internal, internal, internal and external laryngeal branches of the uh, superior laryngeal nerve. Now the, the vagus nerve comes down and gives a branch which is called superior laryngeal nerve. And it comes all the way down and uh, and forms the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Well, the recurrent laryngeal nerve it goes back up and supply many of the muscles of the larynx, many of the muscles of the laryngeal, many laryngeal muscles. And the superior laryngeal nerve divides into an external laryngeal nerve and an internal laryngeal nerve. External, the, this internal one, internal one. Is, is, is mostly, it, it is a sensory nerve. It supplies the mucosa of the, uh, the larynx. Okay, external laryngeal one uh, supplies the uh, cricothyroid muscle. Okay, if you remember uh, the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, there's a muscle called cricothyroid muscle. Okay, uh, so that is, uh, uh, that means that muscle contracts, it, uh, it increases the tension in the vocal cords. If your vocal cords are like this, it increases the tension and increases the pitch of the voice. Okay, so that is uh, gone if you paralyze the uh, external laryngeal branch of the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve. Okay, so you can see that in this diagram, they are all uh, contents of the, at least, you know, in the initial part, contents of the carotid uh, triangle. Mm. So not that also. So here, this uh, you see the internal laryngeal nerve again, internal laryngeal nerve piercing the thyrohyoid membrane, a membrane lying between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage, it pierces the thyroid membrane to enter the inner aspect of the larynx and supply the mucosa. Okay, 
On the other hand, the external laryngeal nerve comes down with the superior thyroid artery, a branch of the external carotid artery uh, to supply the, uh, this one will supply the thyroid gland, of course, and external laryngeal will supply the cricothyroid muscle. Okay. Um, then, uh, okay, the common carotid bifurcation, I, I mentioned this, and the branches, so the, these are the contents of the external, uh, the carotid uh, triangle, external carotid and their uh, veins, re relevant veins, and hyperglossal nerve, superior root of ansa cervicalis, and internal and external laryngeal nerves. These are all contents of the carotid triangle, therefore. Now, uh, you should know the branches of the external carotid artery. Uh, I think I have a slide I'll show you later. Okay, there are about eight branches. Okay, eight to seven branches. We'll come back to it. Then uh, the, the digestive triangle or submandibular triangle, it's a fairly a small triangle. Now, an important content is the submandibular gland and the submandibular lymph nodes there. The submandibular triangle. Uh, so that is that area. Okay, then other than that, you have the facial artery there. Uh, uh, and the facial vein, hypoglossal and mylohyoid nerves. Okay, hypoglossal nerve and the mylohyoid nerves. Uh, hypoglossal nerve, have they labeled it? I'm not very sure whether this is the one, it looks like a vessel. Okay, so anyway, this diagram is not clear. Okay. Then the submental triangle, these are not very important triangles. So, you, if the most important thing in the submental triangle are the submental leaf nodes okay so both triangles are drawn here and you can get uh, the initial tributaries of the anterior jugular veins in that area okay that's all then the muscular triangles um, we described the muscles of the muscular triangles already uh, in the infrahyoid muscles and the other important contents in the muscular triangle are the thyroid and the parathyroid glands thyroid and the parathyroid glands parts of the larynx trachea Pharynx, esophagus, okay, all that are in that triangle and their vessels and nerves with the cervical leaf nodes in that area. Okay, so there are a lot of structures in the muscular triangles. Uh, then, uh, then, you know, you should know about the thyroid gland. Uh, you need to know in detail about the thyroid gland. Okay, it's the blood supply uh, and, and, you know, it's a histology and it's gross anatomy, you know, that how it is related to the tracheal rings, two to four tracheal rings, is there here, okay. Uh, and uh, the extent, upper, the upper extent and the lower extent. Then other point is that uh, the pretracheal fascia encloses the, uh, you know that, encloses the thyroid gland with other, uh, the trachea and esophagus here. And the pre-vertebral uh, fascia, as we said, uh, pretracheal fascia is attached to the uh, hyoid bone here. We mentioned that. Uh, when we swallow, the hyoid bone moves upwards due to the contraction of the, uh, the suprahyoid muscles here. Uh, this moves upwards. When it moves upwards, because of this attachment of pre-tracheal uh, fascia to the hyoid bone and the fact that it encloses the thyroid gland here, uh, the thyroid gland moves up, upwards when you swallow. So this, this fact is taken into, um, it, this fact is used by the doctors when they want to uh, uh, look at the diseases of the thyroid gland, especially the enlargement of the thyroid gland. So they, what they do is they either ask you to swallow, uh, swallow, you know, either your saliva or they will give you a glass of water if you don't have saliva to swallow. So then uh, the moment you, every time you swallow it, the hyoid moves upwards, uh, pulling the thyroid gland with that. So if there are enlargements of the thyroid gland, thyroid nodules, you will see them moving up and down. So it's the first step in examining the thyroid gland rather than jumping and touching it. Okay, so you just inspect it. Uh, inspection is anyway the first step in uh, examination, which you will learn later. So this is a point that you need to remember in relation to the pretracheal fascia and the thyroid gland um, clinical practice. Then the um, external jugular vein, external jugular vein, uh, which is in the superficial fascia. This is the surface marking of the external jugular vein. Surface marking. Now you take the angle of the mandible. You take the angle of the mandible here. And you get the midpoint of the clavicle. Okay, you can check these things on yourself. 
angle of the mandible and the, uh, the midpoint of the clavicle, then you draw a line connecting the two points that will actually represent the external jugular vein. Now, before I go to the next slide, when you want to get the internal jugular vein, this is how you get it. You get the tip of the, man, uh, the mastoid process here and again the angle of the mandible and get the midpoint. Get the midpoint of the two and draw a line to the sternoclavicular joint. Now, your sternoclavicular joint is here. You draw a line from here to here, sternoclavicular joint. Okay. So, it roughly goes like this. Okay. So, it also almost it overlaps the um, sternocleidomastoid muscle. Anyway, the two veins will form an X here. Can you see? They cross each other, one superficial, other one deep. Remember that point. Okay, it's important to remember that. Okay. Now, this external jugular vein is used sometimes for central venous cannulation or central venous lines, especially, you know, when you have all the peripheral lines, including the great saphenous vein, uh, if you cannot access them for some reason to give drugs or fluid, uh, then you will have to access this neck vein, external jugular vein. And sometimes, you know, other veins might not have collapsed, but you want to give parenteral nutrition. Parenteral, parenteral nutrition means IV nutrition, intravenous nutrition for a long period. Because in all other peripheral veins, if you keep a cannula, cannula is a, uh, you know, a cannula, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like this. There is a place for you to inject things and there's a needle like that. Okay. Uh, so you see, when you go to wards, you see patients with cannulas and say like, okay. Now you cannot keep a cannula in a peripheral vein for a long period of time. It gets infected and, you know, the vein gets obstructed because the veins are too small. And here, if you want to keep a, a line um, in an ICU somewhere for a long period, not in other places, uh, for uh, nutrition and all IV, uh, you use a central venous line like this, external jugular vein, vein uh, cannulation. Okay. Uh, then, you know, if you know the surface marking uh, from here to here, you can easily enter it. Okay. Then the, the internal jugular vein, uh, it, it, it has a constant position. Uh, so this is what I mentioned, midpoint between the tip of the mastoid process and the angle of the mandible to the sternocl sternoclavicular joint. And it overlaps the sternocleidomastoid muscle as I showed you before. Um, and, uh, and the other point is, uh, if you want to access it, it actually here, this is the internal jugular vein they have drawn here. Okay. So if you want to access it, you go between the two heads, between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. There's a slight gap. You can touch it and see in your neck. If you touch, you will, you will try to find the, uh, the gap. There's a slight gap between the, uh, the two heads of the, 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 the sternocleidomastoid. Okay. Sternocleidomastoid. So it's a sternum and the clavicle. There's a clavicular head and a sternal head. Okay. So between that, you can get at the internal jugular vein immediately before it enters the subclavian vein and form the, uh, the brachiocephalic vein. Okay. And you know, always it's uh, it's uh, recommended to use the right side rather than left side because uh, the right side, the veins are more in line with the uh, superior vena cava than the left side because the, it's like this, you know, the, your heart is like this. Uh, superior vena cava is more towards the right side. So your brachiocephalic vein, right brachiocephalic vein is like this. Left one has to travel some distance across the mid midpoint of the midpoint of the neck. Okay, to reach the left side. Therefore, it's uh, easy to put the lines into the heart through right side rather than left side because it's more in line with the superior vena cava on the right side. Okay. Uh, then uh, again, you know, internal internal jugular vein also can be catheterized uh, when you want to perform uh, certain things on the heart and all. You can, you can send the catheter through the internal jugular vein. Now, already you know that it is covered by the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Okay, so 
I mean, you don't have to know these things. You don't have to remember. Nobody will ask you, but you know the anatomical basis, you know, uh, that's the important point. Uh, so one way is that you reach it through these two heads, as I mentioned before, okay? Uh, external head and the clavicular head. So this is a point where you can reach it or you can you can uh, go behind in, in upper level, you can go behind the sternopelomastoid, okay? Uh, you can go behind the sternopelomastoid to enter the vein because the vein lies laterally. Artery is medial, vein is lateral in the carotid sheath, okay? So you either go that way or you go between the two heads in front, okay? Okay, now this is a uh, 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 doctor has drawn on the, uh, the MAM muscle, this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the neck of a person before surgery, see. Uh, so this must be the ohmhide. Uh, and um, oh, it looks like the external jugular way. No, yeah, it's external jugular way. Uh, so then your internal jugular will be here, okay. Um, Then uh, about the arteries, uh, common carotid artery. Uh, now this uh, sternoclavicular joint, now you get the clavicle like this. Uh, you get the sternum here. Now the sternoclavicular joint is an important uh, uh, landmark again, because we said uh, the, the, the internal jugular vein, internal jugular vein enters the subclavian vein there and forms the uh, right brachiocephalic vein. So you can say that the right brachiocephalic vein commences at the, uh, behind the uh, sternoclavicular joint. And you can say the internal jugular vein ends at the sternoclavicular uh, joint. Or you can say the subclavian, the internal jugular vein and subclavian vein unite at behind the sternoclavicular, same thing, okay. And other than that, further behind the vein, further behind the vein, you get the, uh, the brachiocephalic artery. Okay, brachiocephalic artery dividing into uh, the common carotid artery and subclavian artery. So that also takes place behind the sternoclavicular joint. Behind the veins, you have get the arteries. Veins are in front of the arteries. No? So that's another point that, that is taking place there. Okay. Um, so I will not uh, go behind these you know, relationships of these vessels. You will have to uh, do it of your own. Otherwise, you will not uh, remember. You can just, you know, uh, go through this when you get the uh, the PDF of the lecture. Okay. Why is this? Okay, this is the same picture that I showed you before. Uh, so this is just to you know appreciate the structures in the carotid sheath which I mentioned. Based on the level at which you take the section, you will either get the common carotid or the internal carotid inside. Now, this looks like external carotid, the internal carotid at its beginning because it lies lateral to the internal carotid, uh, external carotid uh, initially, then it goes behind and deep to enter the carotid canal here, okay? Uh, but anyway, the carotid sheath lies uh, surrounding the internal carotid rather than the external carotid and the common carotid. So these are the branches of the external carotid artery, branches of the external carotid artery. Mm. There are eight branches, as I said before, okay. Most of these branches are given to the anterior side. Most of the branches are here. Now it ends, it ends as the superficial temporal artery, okay. So this is the end branch. Then, then you know, it, uh, it sends the branch before it gives the superficial temporal, that is the, the maxillary artery, okay. Maxillary artery passes behind the neck of the mandible uh, into the intratemporal uh, region. Uh, so these are the last two branches. Then to the anterior side, you get the facial artery, you get the lingual artery, you get the superior thyroid artery. Okay. So inferior thyroid artery comes from the subclavian artery to subclavian thyroid gland. Okay. So uh, here you get the superior thyroid artery closely related to the external laryngeal nerve. So during thyroid surgeries, uh, you actually uh, maybe you know you you tie. Uh, Either it's, it's closer to the uh, gland or something. Avoid tying these two together. Okay. So it's different. Uh, below, you know, you get the inferior thyroid then the current laryngeal coming. Uh, so they are close to each other, closer to the gland. So you tie away from the gland. Here it's the 
the other way I think. Okay, they are closer to each other away from the gland. So you tie closer to the gland because you are going to tie the artery, not the nerve. Okay. During thyroid surgery. Then the other branches are now this must be the occipital artery. Uh, then there's posterior auricular artery, which is not uh, shown here clearly. Then you have the ascending pharyngeal artery. So that makes it eight branches of the external carotid artery. Then uh, the other important thing about the internal carotid is that uh, now we said the common carotid, common carotid and the internal carotid do not give branches in the neck. It's only the external carotid that gives branches in the uh, neck. Now, uh, the internal carotid, uh, it, it, it divides into seven segments. It divides into, it is divided into seven segments. Uh, not that, you know, it, it, it divides into branches. It is the same artery is divided into seven segments uh, once it enters the carotid canal the base of the skull. Once it enters the carotid canal, you divide it into uh, seven segments. You don't have to remember the segments and the branches given from each of these segments. Okay, it's not necessary. But remember that it gives uh, several branches Okay, from these segments uh, while it is inside the petrous temporal bone. You know what is petrous temporal bone. Okay, because that is once it enters the carotid canal, it passes through the petrous temporal bone uh, and then it passes through the cavernous sinus and comes out through the cavernous sinus. Okay, so before it comes out, before it enters the cavernous sinus, uh, these um, any branches are given from each of these uh, segments. Okay, uh, then uh, once it leaves the cavernous sinus, after leaving the cavernous sinus, first branch given is the ophthalmic division. Okay, don't say that uh, the first branch given by the internal carotid artery. If someone says first branch given by the internal carotid artery is ophthalmic, it's wrong. Okay. Because there are many branches given in the petrous temporal bone. Okay. It's the first branch given uh, after it leaves the cavernous sinus. Then these are all branches of the uh, component parts of the um, circle of bilis. Because uh, when it comes to the blood supply of the brain, uh, you there's, a, uh, there's a arterial circle. Uh, you call it circle of bilis. So what happens is this you get the internal carotid after giving the ophthalmic division. You get the internal carotid coming like this. Okay. And uh, it gives uh, this anterior cerebral arteries. Okay. So both sides you get internal carotid coming and giving anterior cerebral arteries. Uh, so they have a communicating artery here, the cerebral tissue. Then, uh, then the, this part of the main artery continues as the middle cerebral artery. Okay. It's the middle cerebral artery. It's an important artery. Then here, this is connected up by the posterior communicating artery, another branch from the internal carotid. Uh, it is connecting up with the middle, the, the posterior cerebral artery. So that's the posterior circulation. Okay, this is the basal artery and the vertebral artery is the posterior one. This is the anterior circulation. So this one connects up with this one. That's how you form the circle of bilis here. So then, you know, you can see when it comes to the branches of the internal carotid, this is ophthalmic. Then, this is this is uh, uh, anterior cerebral. This is middle cerebral, and this is posterior communicating artery. Okay, so you will learn this when you do the blood supply of the brain. Okay. Then the uh, the, the root of the neck. Now the uh, the structures the structures that pass from the neck. To the upper limb. Now, if you have structures coming from the neck and going into the upper limb, okay, or structures coming from the neck and going into the thorax here, or there are structures coming from the thorax and going into the upper limb, or the other way, you know, all these things can be the opposite direction. So, all these pathways, when structures pass from here to here, or here to here, here to here, or here to here, or whatever, they have to pass through the root of the neck. They have to pass through the root of the neck. So you will find all these structures passing through the root of the neck. Okay, so that's the point that I want to raise here. Now the subclavian artery, uh, subclavian artery, artery in the root of the neck. Uh, you know that if you take the 
the arch of the aorta to remember it clear if you take the arch of the aorta you get the uh, brachiocephalic artery to the right side you then you get the uh, left common carotid artery and then you get the left subclavian artery now this uh, brachiocephalic trunk uh, divides into uh, the, the right common carotid and the right subclavian behind the at this point this point is the sternoclavicular joint that i mentioned here okay uh, so this is this is how it happens now therefore you have a subclavian artery directly originating from the arch of the aorta on the left side and on the right side it originates from the brachiocephalic uh, artery behind the sternoclavicular joint then uh, okay this i mentioned okay um, then okay so both uh, both pass above the now if you have the uh, you have the pleura covering the root of the uh, the the, neck, the apex of the lung here so they pass uh, in relation to the uh, the pleura that covers the apex of the lung uh, and uh, they if you if you get the first rib like this if you get the first rib like this uh, if this is the scalene tubercle, your scalenous anterior muscle is attached like this. Okay, so usually the veins in the anterior mediastinum, uh, the, the superior mediastinum, and the root of the neck, veins lie in front of the arteries. Okay, veins lie in front of the arteries. Therefore, uh, I'll give in color. Okay, so therefore the subclavian vein lies in front of the uh, scalene tubercle attachment of the scalenous anterior muscle and uh, the subclavian artery subclavian artery lies behind it subclavian artery lies behind it now at the outer border of the first strip you know it uh, the vein becomes uh, the axillary vein and the uh, artery becomes axillary artery Okay, so this is what I was trying to uh, mention. Uh, this is subclavian vein become the, becoming the axillary vein and this is the axillary artery uh, formed by the subclavian artery. Okay, uh, and uh, your scalenous anterior, if you draw, uh, will you know this behind the clavicle? Okay, will be like this attached between the two. Okay, scalenous medius is attached behind further behind. Okay, so artery passes between the medius and scalenous anterior. Then the, on the other point is that oh, oh, you can also see the, the relationship between the uh, sternoclavicular joint to the bifurcation of the artery and the uh, confluence of the, uh, the two uh, veins. Okay, so then uh, that is one thing. Um, okay. Nothing else uh, here. Then uh, okay about the subclavian uh, artery now. Because of the presence of the scalenous muscle here, I'll draw it uh, like this. Okay, if the scalenous muscle is like this, scalenous anterior muscle, presence of the scalenous anterior muscle here divides the subclavian artery into three parts actually. Like the axillary artery uh, getting divided into three parts by the, the pectoralis minor muscle. Uh, the subclavian artery gets divided into three uh, parts by the scalenous anterior muscle. First part, medial to the muscle. Third part, lateral to the attachment of the muscle. And the second part, behind the muscle. Second part, behind the muscle. That's how the subclavian artery is divided into uh, three parts. Okay. And uh, from the first part of the subclavian artery, this is the first part of the subclavian artery, medial to the muscle attachment here okay uh, has three important branches the vertebral artery the artery that passes through the uh, the foramen transverse foramina transverse area of the cervical vertebrae uh, it enters the, uh, the foramen transverse area of the sixth sixth cervical vertebra uh, first it does not enter the seventh uh, vertebral vein enters the seventh one uh, artery enters the sixth one okay and then uh, passes through fifth, fourth, third, and like that. Then the other important one is the internal thoracic or internal memory artery. Internal thoracic or internal memory artery uh, going down. Then the most important one is the thyrocervical trunk. Thyrocervical trunk uh, 
which gives rise to several important branches. Okay, so these three are from the first part of the subclavian artery. From the second part of the subclavian artery, the part behind the, uh, the scalenus anterior muscle uh, is called the costo cervical trunk. That is also trunk again. Then uh, from the third part, uh, there may or may not be a branch from the third part. Uh, when there is a branch from the third part, that is called dorsal scapular artery. So this, there are slight differences, you know, when it comes to this, these branches, especially dorsal scapula and all. Different terminologies are used by different uh, authors uh, when they write anatomy books. So they, that is an area for a little bit of confusion. Uh, now to relieve that, I, I have done this slide. You read it. I'm not going to describe it uh, too much, uh, especially the, the last part of it. Uh, because some students might get confused after seeing the slide. Those who have already got confused by uh, trying to study these branches, then this slide is for them. Those who are already confused, not for those who are not confused. Okay, because uh, the ones who are not confused might get confused. Okay, so this is how it is. The thyrocervical trunk has three branches: suprascapular artery, which is always you know uh, it's it's called suprascapular artery. There is no problem. And the inferior thyroid artery is always, you know, you call it inferior thyroid artery. There is no confusion because of uh, these two. Then this is the one that confuses the transverse cervical artery because normally this transverse cervical artery has two branches, a superficial branch and a deep branch. Okay. Superficial branch and a deep branch. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, these two branches will, uh, will uh, superficial cervical, this superficial branch is uh, called superficial cervical artery. Some authors use this in place of the transverse cervical artery. So in place of transverse cervical artery, some author use, uh, some people use this superficial cervical artery name. Okay, so that is the confusion. Okay. And this deep branch, deep branch uh, is, some authors call it dorsal scapular artery. Now, if you go back, I said this is dorsal scapular artery is from the third part of the subclavian artery. Okay. Uh, so then, you know, the, the point is this. If there is a deep branch of the transverse cervical artery, then you will not have a uh, dorsal scapular artery coming from the third part of the subclavian artery. There will be no branches from the third part of the subclavian artery. Okay. Only when there is no deep branch from the transverse cervical artery, then you will, uh, you will have a dorsal scapular artery separately coming from the third part of the subclavian artery. So since there is no deep branch, then you will only have a transverse cervical artery. So then rather than calling it transverse cervical artery, they used to call it superficial cervical artery. So something like that. Okay. Uh, but you just go by um, uh, the textbook that, you know, your main textbook says something that you take it as true. Okay. Then uh, subclavian vein. Uh, also can be used for catheterization, subclavian vein. So you can have two approaches. Again, you know, not to remember all these approaches unless your uh, Eastern University staff uh, asks you to do that. Uh, so you, you, you can, you know, just get an idea, you know, anatomically how the vein is placed uh, is well described in these uh, procedures. Okay. So the in infraclavicular approach, you go below the clavicle. It's obvious. Okay. Uh, below the uh, lower border of the clavicle uh, and over the lower surface of the clavicle and uh, you take the junction between the medial one-third and the lateral two-thirds. So it's lateral two-thirds and the medial one-third. You get the junction of the clavicle between the lateral two-thirds and the medial one-third and the needle is directed upwards and posteriorly. You can imagine when the person is lying down, so the, the needle goes deep upwards and posteriorly towards the middle of the suprasternal notch. Now your suprasternal notch is here. Okay. So it's directed towards the middle of the suprasternal notch. So that is the direction of the subclavian vein. Okay. So you will catch the subclavian vein uh, either over the uh, first rib here or proximal to the first rib somewhere here. Okay. So you will catch it here. Okay. Then in, in supraclavicular approach, uh, Again, in the supine position with the head turned to the opposite side, you turn the head to the opposite side um, and along the posterior border of the clavicular head of the sternum. Now you have the clavicular head of the sternum in the mastoid. You go along the posterior border of the clavicular head of the sternum and direct it towards. Now here, uh, 
this needle is directed towards the opposite nipple this is directed towards the opposite nipple of the breast here okay then you can enter the um, uh, subclavian uh, vein there okay uh, so your internal jugular vein is here okay between the two heads this is lateral to the lateral head okay then uh, the thoracic duct thoracic duct uh, enters the usually it's on the left side uh, between uh, to the junction between the, uh, the internal jugular vein and the uh, left subclavian vein okay so the external jugular vein has already entered this by that time okay uh, so internal jugular and subclavian junction on the left side okay um, then on the right side uh, you don't have a thoracic duct you can have a right lip duct right lip duct right lymphatic duct on the right side that can if they if it is there if right lymphatic duct is there on the right side it will open into the same junction junction between the right subclavian and the right internal jugular vein uh, if there is no uh, right lymphatic duct per se lymph from the right side also will enter the thoracic duct and they enter the bloodstream on the left side okay Okay, now these are the things for you to study or recall. You might have separate lectures on these things, even though I don't do it. You have to study the thyroid gland, parathyroid gland in detail, especially the thyroid gland. Okay, it's capsules, it's blood supply, uh, it's histology, uh, and uh, some of the clinical points. Okay, uh, all that. Then the submandibular uh, glands and lymph nodes, cervical. Okay, lymph nodes, superficial cervical, deep cervical, and different groups of deep cervical lymph nodes you will have to uh, study. So this is all uh, I have to tell, I think, yeah. Uh, so I will stop recording here. If you have any questions, you can ask. Uh,